Okay, thank you. Let me share screen. Share screen. I have got uh, my son with me, so he will help me if there are any problems. Uh, by the way, I am uh, speaking from Kuching, so I'm at home, so I'm not wearing uh, a mask like some of you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a big honor for me uh, to have Dr. Ko Kachai to chair this session. As you all should know, he is the immediate past president of the National Malaysian Medical Association. I'm a urologist, so I spend basically most of my time la, on uh, the urinary tract and uh, urinary problems. So today we are going to talk about uh, nocturia and nocturnal polyuria. Well, this talk is sponsored by Faring Malaysia, uh, like most of the talks, like many talks nowadays, and their product they are marketing today is Minarin. So I have to talk about the product uh, some, some way during my lecture. But this lecture is my own independent opinion. And of course, you have to make your own discretion as to what you want to do to your patient. So what are the learning objectives? The topic is nocturia and nocturnal polyuria. And actually it's a very frequent condition. It is often a cause of sleep disturbance. And I'll be talking more from the urologist perspective, whereas Dr. Ng will add in the, the woman's perspective. A woman don't have a prostate, but they also have nocturia and urinary symptoms. And I'll try to bring you to the scientific basis of how we manage nocturia. And of course, uh, nocturia, urinary symptoms, people think of prostate, people think of active bladder. And finally, I hope I can help you to, to diagnose and manage the condition, uh, maybe in collaboration with the specialists in your region. And uh, I will show you some real life examples rather than spending more time on complex studies. At the end of my lecture, I've got one MCQ with a single answer. And if, uh, the, I think the first five who give the correct answer will get a prize. So listen very carefully to this lecture. First of all, we talk about definitions. Huh? Definitions, the nocturia is defined by the International Continent Society as a complaint that the individual had to wake up one. Remember the word one, once or more times. Okay, so that is in the MCQ, once. Huh? You wake up once at night, you have nocturia. So I think almost everybody in this audience will have nocturia. But it must be preceded and followed by sleep. So you go to sleep, and then you wake up to pass your week and you go back to sleep. So that is nocturia. And the important thing that we want to know about is your first uninterrupted sleep period, F-U-S-P, okay? That's important. Now, nocturia defined as passing urine once at night, but collecting urine for the calculation of the nocturnia, nocturnal urine, or do the wedding diary, that urine you pass when you wake up, uh, that is calculated in the nocturnal volume. Although you wake up, you pass the urine, you go and go about doing your business, go and do your war round, or go and see your clinic, that urine is calculated into the nocturnal polyuria. Now, what about, what is this nocturnal, what is this polyuria business? Now, assuming that we sleep eight hours a night, and uh, so the nocturnal volume should be about 800 cc, right? 800 cc or less. Uh, in elder people, I think they are allowed a bit more. In young people, it should be less than 600 cc. So that's the definition of nocturnal polyuria. In my mind, even if you produce less than 600 cc, but you have frequent urination at night, you have a lot of nocturia, that still requires treatment. Huh? So treatment is required for nocturia, treatment is required for nocturnal polyuria. Treatment may be slightly different. Now let's talk about how common is the problem in Malaysia. In, in the, uh, among the urologists, we have a prostate or bladder awareness week every year for many, many years. Uh, and, and usually during that, that weekend, we will have thousands of people who come, uh, patients who come and, and have their urinary symptoms assessed. And the commonest symptom is nocturia, 56%. Uh, this is published by Dr. Te, who is the chief of urology in Sarawak. And uh, this is a lemma article on urinary symptoms in Malaysia. Uh. I also, and of, of the group of them, of the 56% of them, only 13% of them have an initial sleep period of more than two to three hours. So many of these patients are actually affected by sleep disturbance, sleep disturbance. Of course, if you have BPH, if you have more, even you have more patients with nocturia. I participated in an Asian study some years ago. And again, nocturia is the commonest urinary symptom, 64%, 64%. This is in Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, and Hong Kong. But that's quite long ago, but I think the figures are still the same. What is important to us in this audience today is that most of the patients, 78% of the patients are treated by medication. In other words, they do not have to see a surgeon or urologist to have their urinary symptoms treated. 
Now, what about your patients? How often is it in your patients? Actually, Noctura is found in all the age groups, all age groups, including young patients, huh? including young patients. So you think about, you look at your clinic, what are the patients you see in your clinic? How many of them will have Nocturia? And what, what are the consequences of Nocturia? This is a study done by a group of Malaysian urologists who have uh, interest in Nocturia. And these are all the things that they can, they can be affected if you have Nocturia and you have a sleep disturbance. Fatigue, la, bad mood, la, depression. La, and of course, for urologists, like lack of sex drive, la, uh, uh, sex, erectile dysfunction. La. So they have effect on the quality of life. In a study done by another group of urologists in UKM, uh, UKM in 2015, uh, these are all the big time urologists in UKM in, uh, back then in 2015. And they found that actually of the patients with BPH, 85.9% have nocturia or two or more times, uh, two or more times. So nocturia is a big, big clinical problem. Uh, it tends to be more common in older age group, in both men and women. I think Dr. Ng will elaborate more on this. Is common across both genders, although women don't have a prostate. And in this particular study, uh, this study, it shows that most of the men with nocturia, 91.9% of men with nocturia in a big study, they have nocturnal polyuria, polyuria. Okay, so there's a there's the distinction between nocturia and nocturnal polyuria. Treatment is slightly different. And of course, it's intuitively affects the quality of life. Right? If you have nocturia, especially this study show that if you have nocturia more than twice, it will affect your quality of life, sometimes quite dangerously. And what is the danger? If you have nocturia, you have a much higher incidence of fall right? compared to those people with no nocturia. Double, double or triple the incidence of fall. Of course, fall, you know that if you're elderly, if a fall, you could fracture of your femur, the chance of you dying is very high. I mean, pneumonia, even thrombosis, and things like that. It's also intuitive that if you have no, if you have nocturia and you affected your sleep, you will have a loss in productivity. But this is actually a real life study done. This is done in Denmark, where, where they studied 646 patients and they found that they have a 25% decrease in productivity if you have significant nocturia. Now, this is quite an alarming figure that if you have nocturia, you have a double. If you have nocturia more than two times a night, you have a much higher chance of dying. dying. And, and that's not just because of the age. They have, they have factored in the age, they have factored in the comorbidities and the medications. So there's something going on if somebody has Nocturia and nocturnal polyuria. Now, as a urologist, we see all kinds of patients, and I'm sure you see all kinds of patients. So, if somebody comes to you with nocturia and urinary symptoms, you must have the back at the back of your mind, try to figure out what are the possible causes of the urinary symptoms. I'll just go through the list very quickly so that you will not forget about them. We always think that it's the prostate, huh? prostate, BPH, prostate cancer, but don't forget the bladder. The bladder can be overactive, underactive. Disenergic, there can be problem with the urethral structure. There can also be problem with the nearby organs, the cervix, uh, cancer cervix in the female, the rectum, stones in the bladder, of course, they got urinary symptoms, but a stone in the lower ureter can also cause urinary symptoms. So you do ultrasound, there's no stone in the bladder, but the stone is hiding in the lower ureter. And of course, urination is controlled by the nerves, controlled by the hormones. So all this, you have to think of all these factors when you see a patient with urinary symptoms, and including nocturia. Now, now we zoom in on nocturia. What are the causes of nocturia? There are many, many possible causes. I just go through the common ones. Huh? So you have to take a proper history, examine the patient, do basic blood and urine tests, and maybe an ultrasound. Then you think of all these factors, psychological factors. If the patient got depression, the patient got insomnia, of course they got nocturia. If the patient has got what is called primary polydipsia, in other words, they drink a lot of urine, drink a lot of, uh, of of fluid day and night. Uh, so I'm not encouraging patients not to drink, but they have to maybe readjust their intake of the fluid. So if they have nocturia affecting the quality of life, they reduce the intake of fluid at night, but they may make up for it in the morning. Bladder problems, early heart failure. Early heart failure, the fluid collects in the leg and when they lie down at night, they have got fluid returning to the heart and nocturia. Reduced bladder capacity in the older age group. And of course, if you've got diabetes, huh? If you take, continue to take sugar, take a lot of carbohydrate, have a nice makan at night, you will have nocturia. And of course, we know that BPH, they are, they are unable to empty the bladder well. 
especially at night, they, this can also contribute to nocturia. So the treatment is multifactorial. It may be due to a single cause. It may be due to a mixture of causes. So it's quite challenging, but I think if you're a family physician, you are in the best position to manage all these things. Whereas for me as a urologist, we like more or less like talk about the prostate. Now, we cannot aim to stop all nocturia. What we aim is for the patient to have a good sleep. And what is the good sleep? The good sleep is the first five hours. First five hours when they have undisturbed sleep, where they don't have to wake up the past urine. That's the time when the body and the mind will rest. Eh? So, so, so that is what we aim for. We aim for them to have a good five hours sleep. We aim for them to have a reduced nocturia, but the idea is not to stop nocturia. The idea is not to prevent the patient from being dehydrated. Of course, if you don't take fluid the whole day during fasting month, of course, you will have no nocturia, but it's not good for health because you need the fluid uh, you know, for, for, for you to hydrate your, your, yourself so that you won't get strokes or heart attacks. Now, having said that, nocturnal polyuria is very common in nocturia patients. Huh? Nocturia patients. So up, up to 80% of patients with nocturia will have nocturnal polyuria. So you also have to address the nocturia, the nocturnal polyuria problem. And why do people have polyuria at night? Because they have lost the normal rhythm of production of antidiuretic hormone. Notice when you are a young man or young girl, you go to sleep at night, the body will produce more antidiuretic hormone so that you don't pass so much during the night. But as you grow older, you lost this rhythm and your bladder also lost your ability to hold urine. So nocturia is very, very common in the older people. I've, I think I've, I've given enough data to, to say that this is not a lifestyle condition. It is a serious medical condition. It can be treated if you know the science, if you know the cause of it, and it requires you to treat nocturia like any other medical condition, like hypertension, diabetes. Take a history, examine the patient, do basic investigations, give the appropriate management. And of all conditions, I think nocturia is a condition where you really require the patient to be involved in the management. And of course, like any other medical condition, you have to be followed up by a doctor. So we aim for five hours of continuous sleep. First sleep, first sleep. Okay, so, so we, aim, we aim to make sure that the patient is well hydrated, make sure the patient do not have falls, we make sure the patient have all the medications that have been, have been given, they do not have any interaction. We don't just give them medications, we get the patient involved in the lifestyle management of these patients. We've, I'll talk about lifestyle later on. We try to avoid uh, using drugs as the first choice, but we, of course we must have medication uh, as, as a possible option for treatment. And, and of course, medications are expensive and long-term for some people, it may not be sustainable, right? especially if in the prior practice. So treatment for urinary symptoms, I think in the previous lectures, we know we can use alpha blockers to improve the urine flow, to relax the prostate. We can give them 5 alpha reductase to shrink the prostate. We can give them medications to relax the bladder, the beta agonists or anticholinergics. And also we, also, we also know that, that the PD5 inhibitors like Tadalafil 5 milligrams is also good not only for erectile function, but also for pelvic function. Now, we know that the urine is produced by the kidneys, so we must give them a medication that affects the kidneys, and that is um, desmopressin or vasopressin. Huh? So that will reduce the urine output by the kidneys. So the kidney is a very important part of control of nocturia. So it, if you give them desmopressin, it will reduce you will reduce the production of urine and reduce the nocturia in these patients. Eh? I, my main, main emphasis will be on men. Dr. Ng will talk about the female later on. She'll probably show you a very similar slide. Eh? So you give them desmopressin, it will reduce the nocturia from three to 1.7. Remember this, we do not aim to stop urination at night. We do not aim to stop urination completely at night. We aim to, have, to let them have at least a five hour or as near as five hours as possible, undisturbed sleep, so that they can wake up fresh the next day. Okay, so that is a great improvement from two to 35 if you give them desmopressin. So it is useful not only in the male, but also in the female, huh? in the female. Now, if you use desmopressin, the effect is quite dramatic and you can, you can use it. The studies have shown up to long-term up to 12 months. Beyond 12 months, of course, we have to discuss, maybe by then 
the patient have learned all the lifestyle adjustments, they may be able to taper off the medication or if they have side effects, maybe they have to take less medications. I think generally speaking, most patients do not want to take medications in the long term. Now let's talk about the medication that we use uh, that, that's more present. There are many formulations. The commonest formulation that we use, that I use nowadays in many of my patients is to give them sublingual. In other words, the mineral is given under the tongue. Okay? Under the tongue, it is, it is not taken with water. Not taken with water. Uh, in earlier days, we actually give them a tablet. Eh? A tablet, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 milligrams. Uh, the sublingual is better absorbed. It's 60, 60 micrograms. If it's not, there's no sufficient, we can give them 120 micrograms. Okay, the idea is to reduce the production of urine by the kidneys. They have the newer formulation, a lower dosage called Nog Nogduna. It's 25 to 50 micrograms. It's available in Singapore, but not available in Malaysia yet. Uh, I know among the doctors in the audience, there are some pediatric uh, pediatricians. Uh, the usage in pediatric, in, in pediatric patients for the treatment of primary nocturnal aneurysis eh? Uh, or diabetes insipidus is a different formulation. It's a much higher dose. It's mainly 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligram, uh, milligram. Because in children, they have a different metabolic rate. Uh, so the, the dosage for treatment for PNE is different from the dosage for treatment of nocturnal polyuria in the elderly. So this is taken sublingual. It comes to a method foil. You peel it open and put it under the tongue. You do not have to drink any water with it. You take it without water, so it doesn't add on to the, the, the water load for the patient. So it acts on the kidneys, it doesn't act on the bladder or the bladder neck or the prostate. It reduces the production of urine by the kidneys. So therefore, it is extremely important that you have to enforce fluid restriction. If somebody is taking a lot of drinks at night, and so some people, they sleep with the aircon on or they sleep with the mouth open and when they get up to pass urine, they drink another cup of water. So these patients are absolutely contraindicated to taking desmopressin because they, they will get hemodilution, they get hyponatremia uh, and, and uh, they get into problems with the brain stem. Uh, the brain stem. So you must check patients, the sodium at beginning at three days and at seven days and at one month. And if the sodium is low, you have to stop the medication. Um, so try, try not to correct the, so, the sodium too quickly because if you do that, then uh, they can have a condition called CPM, cerebral pontine myelitis. Huh? The pons, huh? the pons get affected and they can become para, paraplegic. Uh, you have to use the treatment with care in the elderly. Yeah? Elderly means 60, 65, I'm 66. So, so I'm considered as elderly, but to me, there's no contraindication. You just have to use it with greater care for patients who are above 65 years of age and for patients who have got uh, already a, a low sodium to begin with. Huh? When, if the sodium is low, you have to stop the medication and you have to replace the sodium very slowly, yeah? very slowly with isotonic, huh? with isotonic saline. Uh, I have a patient who was my regular taxi driver when I used to, when I go to Miri and he had a few doses of oral mineral, huh? he, he, I think he was given a quite a high dose, 0, uh, 0 0.2 milligrams. And, uh, and when he was admitted to hospital for confusion, for weakness, he was given fast correction because the physician saw the sodium is 110. So, they, okay, let's correct it fast. And he ended up uh, with lower limb weakness, huh? lower limb paresis, because he suffered from C, uh, CPM after, after taking the, the, uh, the mineral. So you have to be very careful with this particular complication uh, when you give the patients mineral. So the next thing is, when you talk about sleep, huh? sleep is multifactorial. It's not just the nocturia. There's so many other factors. Your stress, your light, the temperature, your exercise, your diet. So the patient must, must be involved when we want them or when they want to sleep well. There are so many factors. I will illust illustrate to you uh, about the, the idea of sleep hygiene. Uh, of course, before that, before, the, before you talk about that, it's very important they have a frequency volume chart. Okay, make sure that make sure they are not suffering from from primary uh, uh, polydipsia. In other words, they keep on drinking water, and uh, and they should make sure the urine output at night. Uh, to me, the urine is the best uh, so that it doesn't topple over. No, so they have to make a chart of how much they drink, how much they pass over over the night time. Um, patients for all kinds of diseases 
they'd like to come and see you for a pill. Or the patient said, why don't you operate on me? I'm 69 years old. Next year, my insurance will expire. Do an operation for me so that, so that when I'm 70, I don't have this nocturia, I don't have these urinary problems. So, so, but actually, in actual fact, for almost all diseases, lifestyle, lifestyle changes is extremely important. Right? It's extremely important. So you can also boost your own production of hormones, all kinds of hormones, right? testosterone, uh, including, including hormones that regulate the urination, in play, hormones that regulate your sleep. So walking, exercising is very important. And, and you should redistribute your fluid intake. Don't take too much fluid at night and learn how to sleep well. Let's go sleep hygiene. I'll give you some clues, eh? some clues. You may think that I'm just talking from the intuitive point of view, but actually there are, there are studies. There are studies and many good studies nowadays are done from Korea, from Taiwan and from China. This is a huge group of, of men in Korea, 70,000 men. And they study their urinary symptoms versus their physical activity. And they find that patients with low physical activity have much higher urinary symptoms. What about treatment for the urological condition? You know, patients come to see urinary symptoms. Let's give them an anticholinergic, like solifenacin, and they will stop the urination, stop the bladder from contracting. But in actual fact, if the patient still continue to produce a lot of urine, patients with nocturnal polyuria, you give them anticholinergics for the bladder, the nocturia persists. Okay, nocturia persists. There's very mild reduction of patients from nocturia if they have nocturnal polyuria. So that is not a good treatment for nocturnal polyuria. This is another case. Eh? I show you some real life cases. This is a patient who went to the clinic Kasiatana, the family clinic. And, uh, and uh, the doctor did a very good urological history, uh, focused urological history. Patient has frequency, patient has urgency, Patient has nocturia four times, but he has no problem passing urine. He doesn't have weak stream. He doesn't have incomplete emptying. He doesn't strain. So in this, and then the check, you know, diabetes is so common. Every patient that comes in to see you, you should check the blood sugar. Not only the blood sugar, the doctor even checked the HbA1c and it's all normal. He did a PR, do a rectal examination, prostate is enlarged. But most men above 50 would have enlarged prostate, right? Prostate and lush. Blood pressure, okay. Pulse rate, okay. So he discussed with the yeah, FMS, the family medical specialist. And they decided to give this poor patient terajosin. Terajosin, one milligram for three weeks. Terajosin is an alpha blocker. It's used for hypertension. It can increase the urine flow. But this patient doesn't have a poor flow. So this is a case of misdiagnosis. So don't give every patient the same treatment. Okay, so, so that, is, that is, of course, there are other medication like psilocybin. You know, they relax the prostate gland. Uh, you can also relax the bladder by giving them an uh, anticholinergic or beta-3 agonist like mirabegron. So, so actually, if you give them medications for the bladder and for the prostate, it does not, it does not reduce, it does not reduce uh, the nocturia very much. This is another patient. This is another patient. He has nocturia two to three times since 2006. Okay, so he went and see his local doctor. And of course, the local doctor said, okay, you go and do an ultrasound. An ultrasound shows enlarged median lobe. Enlarged median lobe. Okay, median lobe. Kidney is normal. The bladder is normal. Post white residue, only 30 meals. Okay. So urinary symptoms are all nocturia. Okay, you need to do a urine cytology. So this is a very misinformed specialist. So the urine cytology cost him 1,005 ringgit. And it's okay, never mind. This, this radiology said do a PSA. So do a PSA, PSA is 0 0.7. That is very low. PSA less than 1.5, equivalent to a prostate that is not enlarged, less than 1.5. But the radiologist reported median lobe blade. And so for most of the young urologists and most of the surgeons, median lobe cannot be treated medically. So median lobe requires scraping, requires TRP. So this patient was asked to have a TRP done, but actually his complaint, original complaint was nocturia, nocturia. So he was a bit upset. Oh, so he came and see me. And what is the most important test for me to do? These are the tests that he eventually did. Of course, some of the surgeons will even do a cystoscopy, et cetera, et cetera, or even a CT scan. 
the most important test when you do a patient, when you have a patient who have urinary symptoms, who have difficulty passing urine, is to do a urophorometry. Do a urophor, just like doing ECG. They pee into a machine, normal is like this. If there's obstruction, they have a low urine flow rate. And this patient has got the urine flow rate of 16.8, way above normal. Normal is 15. So he, in actual fact, he definitely 100% does not require surgery or medication for his prostate. What he requires is treatment for his nocturia. So this is how we sort of tease up the different causes of nocturia, which can coexist with uh, ovary bladder, can also coexist with prostate, prostate obstruction. And for prostate obstruction, we give them an alpha blocker. But if the patient has got underlying nocturnal polyuria, the alpha blocker will not treat it completely. The alpha blocker will make them pass urine better, maybe less residual volume. So, so some of them, 15% of them will have an improvement after taking alpha blocker. But if you have given the patient alpha blocker and the response is inadequate, they still have nocturnal polyuria, then you can add on mineral for these patients. Again, with all the previsol of the, of, the, of the sodium, of the age group, uh, to have to monitor the sodium carefully. Now, patients with nocturia are often referred to me for surgery. In fact, I remember when I was in GHKL, many of the Tansri doctors could refer to me, dear Clarence, please do an early PRP for this patient. He's born by the nocturia. So if you do a TRP for a patient with prostate obstruction, giving them a TRP will not improve nocturia very much. It improves a little bit because they can pee better, so they got less residual urine. We also know that nocturia is the most significant complaint among patients. This is an advertisement put at the entrance of a hospital. This is a new treatment put at the entrance. As you walk into this private hospital, this entrance there, it says, after this treatment, you will have without bathroom breaks. It means after the treatment with this new procedure, you will have, you have no nocturia. And what is this treatment for? This treatment is for the prostate enlargement. So, so this is a bit of a... Unfortunate advertisement, unfortunate advertisement, misunderstanding of the, the scientific basis for nocturia. Now, before I end, I need to talk about this very important topic about sleep um, and sleep apnea. Operative sleep apnea apparently is very common in Australia. Uh, I think it's also quite common in Malaysia, but it may not be strictly sleep apnea. It may be uh, associated with, uh, with uh, sleep disorders, restless leg syndrome, some kind of obstructive, obstructive sleep problem. Uh, and, and you go to the internet, there are many, many studies on it. In fact, there are YouTubes on it. What is the correlation between sleep apnea and nocturia? When you have sleep apnea, the brain will stimulate the, the heart, atrium to produce a chemical called ANP or atronatriuretic peptide. When you have this peptide in the body, you produce a lot of urine. So, so if you can treat the sleep apnea, many of these patients will have an improvement of their nocturia. Okay. So, so, so if you give them sleep apnea, if you if you give them if you give them uh, treatment, usually we give them a CPAP, uh, CPAP, CPAP to 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 improve the oxygenation of the brain, so that they don't have apneic spells. So, so that they can have an improved sleep. Uh, improved sleep. You can also monitor your sleep. But simple devices, uh, bracelets that you, you wear on your on your wrist, uh, wear on your wrist. Uh, so sleep apnea is an important topic, which quite often we forget about. So, so the treatment of nocturnal polyuria is multifactorial, multifactorial. So these are the lifestyle changes which you can uh, you can undertake. First of all, you have to reduce the intake of fluid, not the whole day, but you rearrange it such that you, you drink less four hours before sleep. And if you have leg swelling in the afternoon, you can lie down for a while. Uh, maybe use compression dressing. Uh, lie down, not to sleep, not to sleep. Because if you sleep in the afternoon, you cannot sleep at night. Uh, so that the fluid will go back to the heart. Uh, you can wear compression dressing. And, uh, and uh, some, some doctors will give them a diuretic in the afternoon so that they can empty some of the fluid out. Uh, some of the fluid out. So compression dressings and lying down in the afternoon are very effective for many patients with nocturnal polyuria, nocturnal polyuria. So these are the lifestyle changes that they can, they can make use of, especially for patients who are not suitable for taking uh, minerin. So that's actually myself, like myself. We cannot simply take pictures from the internet now because of copyright issues.
other things which affect sleep, so-called sleep hygiene, not sleep hygiene, because if you don't sleep at night, uh, if you cannot fall asleep at night, then of course you have nocturia. And nowadays, because of the change in the lifestyle, uh, you know, people use aircon, people use CCTVs in the room, there's a lot of light at night. Uh, you know, this is a CCTV in the room at night. So your eyes, your brain is, 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 is uh, sort of misinformed. They thought it's still a daytime. So they do not produce enough ADVP to, to allow you to reduce the intake. There's a lot of noise, you know, a lot of lorries come around at night. Uh, so it's important that, that you have, you adjust your room temperature, the noise level, the light in the room, so that you can have a better sleep. So sleep hygiene is also an important part of the whole lifestyle change to tackle patients uh, with nocturia. So, so, so that time, before you go to sleep, make sure you empty the bladder well, properly double empty the bladder. You make sure that you adjust your medications. Don't take diuretics at night. Make sure that the sugar is controlled. A lot of patients have high sugar at night. So they will also have nocturnal polyuria. Okay, that practice double voiding and readjust your fluid intake. Uh, don't take a lot of fruits, a lot of sugar, salt at night so that they will reduce the, the intake of, uh, uh, of, of uh, solid solutes uh, so that you have less nocturia. And nighttime to prevent falls for elderly patient, make sure they don't fall down in the bathroom, put anti-sleep mat. And, and actually it's more, more important, they should have a urinal in the room instead of going to the toilet to pass urine at night. Because once the patient will fall, it is, it is, it's a big disaster for that patient because he get admitted for a surgery, he got all kinds of complications. Finally, I wanted to tell you the story of my friend. This is Professor Christopher Chen. He is the head of urology in Singapore General Hospital. And he wrote this in his book. So I don't think it's, it's confidential. Okay, it's in his book. He says he also has this voiding problem, getting to pee at night. So what did he do? He put a catheter. He put a catheter into the bladder, to the urethra. And then he had a wonderful sleep at night. Huh? Only after that, I have a wonderful uninterrupted sleep at night. And next day you are fresh. Next day you're fresh. So you put catheter, of course, catheter goes on problems, I know. So if if it's an elderly man, put a catheter to the penis, it will cause problems with the urethra, urethritis, erosion. So long-term long term long -term bladder catheter in the elderly is better as a super PB catheter. So read this book. It will tell you a lot about being a doctor, being a urologist, and how to handle urinary problems. So my, my second last slide. So these are my take-home messages, the summary of my rather long lecture. The nocturia is a very common symptom. Huh? It affects your sleep, affects your quality of life. Polyuria is slightly different subset. You have to treat it slightly differently. But even if you don't have nocturia, no, don't have polyuria, you still require treatment. Lifestyle changes are very important, including walking. Dietary manipulation is important, especially to reduce the intake of salt, sugar, and carbon at night. Modify your fluid so that you take less, have less fluid in the body at night when you go to sleep. Empty the bladder well. Control all the medical conditions, diabetes, hypertension, strokes, and medications are important. There are many kinds of medications you can take for your prostate, for the bladder, for anxiety, for your, for your, for your psychological status. And finally, don't forget, there's another drug called desmopressin or minerin, which can make a lot of difference to this problem of nocturnal polyuria. It will really help you a lot, and I hope I've given you enough evidence. So with this, I hope your patients and yourself will have less sleepless nights. Now I come to my last slide. This is the one MCQ. There's a single answer. I'll read the questions. I think I still got uh, 10 minutes. And uh, the first five correct answers they sent to this telephone number will get a prize. So we go to, go to the A, B, C, D, E. Yeah? The first is, Nocturia is the commonest lower urinary tract symptom. Remember, the answer is the false, uh, false, not the correct one. The causes of nocturia are polyfactorial, polyuria, diabetes, prosthetic obstruction, ovective bladder, heart failure. Primary nocturnal and urinary insurance is treated with a higher dose of minerine compared to nocturnal polyuria in adults. And alpha blocker effectively reduces nocturnal polyuria. First uninterrupted sleep period of five hours is desirable for re restor restorative quality sleep. So this is again like a, a take home message, right? So one of them is false. 
So whoever sends that correct answer to this telephone number will get a prize. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman.